much of what we do, then we kind of prepped, so I have my Blackberry out only because I can remember the questions I threatened to ask Jim. Um, and then we'll open it up for a larger discussion. So you want to start and say what you do? No, you start. Oh, I start. Okay. okay. Um, I, uh, your images are up. Oh, my yeah. images are up there. Well, it would be fun if you talked about my images. <laughs> We're going to go back to the big circle. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Oh. See, but that's how we made it. <laughs> my husband's in the theater, and that's what he taught me. You know, if it looks like it's sold out, then more people want to watch it. Got it? Um, I uh, run an island in the, har in the New York City Harbor uh, called Governor's Island. It's a 172 acre island that is a former military base, so it had been closed to the public uh, for its entire history. When it was transferred by the federal government, uh, they put in a ban on residential housing, so uh, we couldn't pursue kind of conventional development methods um, and many other complications uh, that are too long to say, but basically I started there in 2006 and we very consciously decided to leave and the way we did that was we took a permit, uh, sort of an open permit process, so very similar to what you would see in a municipal park, um, so that any organization could uh, use our historic buildings as well as our green spaces to create uh, programming. Um, and what you'll see, can, can you just advance the slides? Um, so you'll see as we go through the slides, uh, that's Mark DeSuvero's uh, exhibition presented by Storm King. Uh, this is the Jazz Age Lawn Party. Um, this is a, actually a Creative Time project, Anthony McCall's uh, installation in a historic chapel. Uh, this is actually a new piece funded by actually Art Place, uh, what we call a permanent piece of art by an artist, Mark Hanforth. Um, this is a festival produced by the Dutch government uh, in 2009, a site-specific performance. Uh, this is, uh, oh, Get Out and Play, sorry, I thought it was improv everywhere, um, but uh, Get Out and Play. Uh, this is, uh, we have a venue that does a lot of concerts, so this is probably, an, it looks to me like actually a live act, not a EDM. We have a lot of EDM concerts that hold 3,000 people. Um, this is an artist project in one of our houses, um, uh, uh, produced by a di different uh, branch of the Dutch government, artist uh, Slow Knitting. Uh, this is a performance in one of the National Park Service sports on the island, um, a site-specific dance uh, created by a local, uh, curated by a local uh, dance organization, Dancing in the Streets. Uh, this is another uh, piece, this is our new park which hasn't opened yet, um, so uh, you're one of the first people to see this. It doesn't look like this today, it's covered in snow, um, but it'll open in May. Uh, this is another, uh, this looks like it's Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Uh, this is an artist working in a studio. Uh, we have a year-round artist studio program. Uh, this is a Figment, kind of one of our signature projects. It's a participatory arts festival um, that happens every June, and they also do uh, season-long uh, sculptures and artist design miniature golf. Uh, this is another Mark DeSuvro. You can see people frolicking. Uh, this is a project for the new museum um, as part of a larger exhibit they did, uh, needed a site. Uh, this is a Russian artist. Um, he wanted a derelict site, so we provided it. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, people frolicking. I can't actually tell you what festival that is. Um, might be a family festival, I have no idea. Uh, this is Henry V uh, being performed site-specific. They started in a fort in Manhattan. The audience and the actors came over on a boat, and so uh, Act One, right, is England. Act Two is France, so we were France. Um, uh, this is, uh, again, another view of our new park, um, the public previewing it, and this is an artist-designed treehouse um, that's also sort of become a signature project, and you can see a little bit of the miniature golf course. This was probably last summer. Uh, this uh, sort of was a signature project last year. Uh, this is a festival of vintage, uh, all rideable carousels and carnival rides um, collected by two men in France who then produced and presented this uh, festival on Governor's Island. Uh, this is a, another sculpture, a uh, figment sculpture. Uh, this is a slow food, not the slow food that we know, but it was an artist project where you had to eat slowly and you were served by older people. Um, I can't remember the name of the artist, uh, dance, uh, site-specific dance, Jody Oberfelder. She raised the money for this on Kickstarter. Um, it's now actually um, playing, uh, uh, performing somewhere else in New York in Studio 360. He's about to do a piece about this particular project. Uh, this is another jazz lawn party. There. So anyway, so it's very cold and wintry in Governor's Island right now, but that gives you an idea of what we're like when we're open. Um, so basically, we have an open call. We don't fund anything, we don't select anything, and we don't curate anything. So all of those, pro we like to say we're the island created by and for New Yorkers. 
Um, all of those projects, some of them are created by tiny organizations that barely exist. Some of them are created by very famous organizations like the New Museum, the International Center for Photography. Um, we don't get involved in any of the content. Um, there's an open call. Um, it's rolling. You can come to us in the middle of the summer and say, I have a project for next week. Um, and if you can sign a permit and have insurance, um, then you can do it. So um, we have certainly seen the island transformed by performance and temporary projects. When I started the summer before, 8,000 people came the whole summer. Last summer, we had 400,000 visitors in 40 days. We're only open, uh, up until this year, we've only been open on the weekends. Um, and people come because they expect this incredibly eclectic range of programming. Um, it's not just a park, it's a destination. Um, and they, they're all New Yorkers, 85% New Yorkers. Um, and that's very conscious. So that's kind of what we do. We've obviously seen this is what has built our identity. It's quite an extraordinary site. Um, we have incredible views of the Statue of Liberty. But it's this uh, evanescent, ephemeral, temporary performance project, a uh, broadest definition of culture that have really made us, what we like to say, a very lively and loved place, which was very improbable when we started. So that's us. Great. Uh, I'm Jim Lasko. I run a company called Red Moon Theater in Chicago. We create these large scale mechanical contraptions that are used to enliven, activate, uh, animate public space. Sometimes those contraptions are platforms for uh, our own performance with professional performers, acrobats, um, but sometimes they're also platforms for um, everyday citizens, people who would not necessarily consider themselves uh, artists or creative people at all. Um, so I don't know, we're gonna run through, I think mine's on a, this is a, a, a series of, of houses that we, actually sunk into the Jackson Park Lagoons, the one-time site of the 1893 World Fair. This is on the J. Pritzker Pavilion stage. This is an adaptation of Old Man in the Sea um, done on the Steppenwolf um, stage. This, these are contraptions actually that we make that um, pay our bills a little bit, that we rent out. This is a, just a scene from a, a, um, a series of, of sort of uh, urban interventions. This actually played on the Disney stage, some pyrotechnic stuff, and there's a human hamster in there. Um, this was a, a residency in a school where they um, were moving out and they made these, um, these products. This as well. This was called a momentary opera. I don't even know what that is or how it got in there. Um, these are again, these are, th those were in urban parks. This was part of a Logan Square Halloween event that, that gathered about 20,000 people to that neighborhood on, um, on a single night in, in, um, on Halloween. Um, a show called Long Live the King that happened in a, in a public um, space. This, that whole tower got erected as part of the show. This is a thing called The Ladder Machine and a show um, called Last of My Species that happened in, uh, on the lakefront. Some of those people are professional performers and some of them are um, community members. This was in the Rockefeller Chapel, an adaptation of Hunchback. This is the White House. Um, Hunchback, these shows toured around. Um, but the, you know, the, the project that we were funded for for our place is um, this audaciously ambitious thing of seeing if we couldn't create somehow what Chicago's Mardi Gras would be. What would the uh, Chicago's running of the bulls be? How could we create a signature event that grew up so genuinely from the kind of core um, assets of um, Chicago that it became an indelible and, 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 and um, uh, permanent feature of the city. Um, so we're working in um, this first year in 15 of Chicago's 77 wards, some of the lesser served areas of the city, to create these sculptural pieces that will float down the Chicago River and then um, through a kind of uh, extensive urban ritual be burned. And as they burn, they uh, actually open to reveal another entity inside. So the exterior is uh, reflective of what that community wants to be rid of, what they uh, don't want in their, um, in, within their community. And then the interior piece is what they, they want to signal to the city that they're proud of. And 
value. So um, it's a huge project, and a lot of the things that were talked about today are, are ringing for me in terms of the need for um, not only um, trying to create the project, but trying to track the creation of the process, trying to, to um, do the base level um, uh, data accumulation so that we can study the impact over time, both, I think, um, economic impact and, and, and cultural impact of it. So it's very complicated. Great. So right we now. thought we'd ask each other questions, but I see some people, so can we just smush the circle out a little bit so everybody's in the same? Uh, so do you want to start asking me? Yeah, I've, so I've had the chance to talk to Leslie before. We got to um, be in a panel in Aspen together with a bunch of mayors, and you were very proud of saying uh, that, that you, you didn't curate, you didn't, uh, some of the things you just said, like we don't select, we don't curate, we don't do anything, and yet um, it seems to me by my definition there's some form of curation, which is to say if somebody had given you a different space, not Governor's Island, to uh, occupy with culture, you may have chosen a different strategy. Yeah, I, I think it's, well, Sherry's sitting across from me who's uh, in Times Square. So if Sherry and I switch jobs, I think we'd have a really different strategy, right? So everybody goes to Times Square that, you know, we had the opposite problem. We were abandoned. There was no reason to go to Governor's Island. And we needed people to feel, we wanted it to be messy. So how do you make an abandoned place in the middle of a city that nobody can live messy? You hand it over to people and you take you're comfortable with the risks that happen when stuff, you know, is sometimes great, sometimes not great. Um, people can tell the difference, um, but uh, also we have, by doing that, uh, there are, and there are other people here from New York who could speak to this, there are thousands of artists who have done projects on Governor's Island, and they have huge equity in our space. And I think if we had taken a different strategy, like a sort of traditional curatorial strategy, um, they would not have that equity. You know, the local creating community would not have that equity, um, and that's been incredibly important. And then I would also say that the public gets that there's not a curator. They get that there's this sort of serendipity, I can wander in and there's different voices speaking. Um, and that's what makes cities, to me, so exciting. And so that was our challenge, was how do you make, truly, an abandoned place accessible only by boat, uh, have the energy of a city. So, should I switch? So, okay, yeah. Yeah, so Jim, in, in Jim's website, use a word that actually we haven't heard in the last day, which is spectacle. Right. And I think that most people think of spectacle, right? The Super Bowl halftime, that was a spectacle. Um, Bruno Mars. So. Can you talk a little bit about why you use the word spectacle and sort of how it might resonate for the rest of us? And because that's not a word that that. Uh, so that was a failed attempt to uh, reappropriate a word that has been um, collectively dismissed by the art world. Um, oftentimes, spectacle is used as the counterpoint to substance, right? Like we, um, this, w where where. Uh, where form meets content is substance, and then everything else is spectacle. And so um, that we thought, you know, it'd be interesting to try to claim the extra um, and and call our work that um, in some ways. Um, so it didn't work so well. We didn't, we haven't persuaded anybody that that's so it's just that on your website. So use. persuaded <laughs> me on your website, but yeah. actually, but, if I went um, to Chicago, and <laughs> no, it's it's you know, it's it, it's a word that. Um, for example, a group called Royal Deluxe uses the word spectacle. Um, in, in a, in, Are in people familiar with Royal Deluxe's work? If you have not, like just Google the, gr what is it, the girl and the? The, the, the elephant the and the Sultan's girl, elephant, the Sultan's elephant. And just have a little tissue next to you, because you, yeah. because it's, you would cannot imagine that gigantic puppets moving through the streets of London could be so moving. But it, uh, I've cried multiple times watching their work, only on video, I've never seen it live. Yeah, I've seen it live. It's amazing work, and there's a, a, a bunch of amazing things about it. But its grandiosity and its superfluity, its superfluity, uh, is is its merit. Is the fact that it is doing this thing that there could be no sensible reason to do, really, that it, and, and the scale of it and the sheer uh, uh, amount of communal force it takes to make to bring that work into um, a city is 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 its expression and is the, its virtue in some ways. And so that was the effort. Now it's your turn. We're alternating. Okay. Um, 
And then we'll open well, maybe up. you'll just tell us about your most spectacular failure. Well, of course, none of them are mine because we don't produce any of them. I would say my favorite was the food, <laughs> the food truck clusterfuck. As a, if you actually Google the food truck clusterfuck, you will actually. There's been one since in another location that has superseded it. But um, the risk that you take, of course, is that not everybody's you know Nato Thompson in creative time. <laughs> so people who produce a food truck festival without enough food kind of shouldn't really be in business So <laughs> on an island. Um, that was a big failure. That was a big weekend, and people were really hungry. Um, and uh, they, they are, there are rare cases when you're not allowed to submit a permit again, but I'd say, <laughs> actually, we even let them try again, and they, they had a beer festival without enough bartenders, so then we just said, we're kind of done with you. Um, I would say, actually, in general, what's interesting about food, which, so we, we believe very strongly that culture is everything, right? It's not art, it's not visual art, it's the old definition. It's folkloric dance, it's food. Um, Everyone loves street food, and but we have actually not seen the food festival model really work. So we had a bunch of them. We had another guy who couldn't pay his bills. So that's been actually disappointing because people love it. Um, they come in droves. Those, and, and the blogosphere, the food blogosphere in at least our city, is so intense. And we all, the, cult the culture world, have a lot to learn from those people. Um, and also what you see is that young people, people under the age of 30, I don't understand this, will pay $65 to go to a food festival to eat. We used to have Pig Island was one of our signature events. You know, that $65 is a real amount of money um, to stand on a lawn and eat little bits of pig. Um, but that, unfortunately, there was sort of a flowering of food. And then it's, you know, besides there's an, a, a wonderful kind of site-specific food festival in New York called Smorgasburg. But other than that, that really hasn't taken hold. And that's a big disappointment of the so economics. So but, uh, well, the first was the food truck clusterfuck, which didn't have enough food. And then the guy, we just haven't seen uh, people, I think, figure out how to econo make economically viable a food festival. So that's really interesting. So you can have a bunch of food trucks parked somewhere. So we, of course, have mobile food um, as a concession. But the sort of food-related event, there was a sort of flowering of them, and then they've kind of dissipated. I think it's economics. Can I ask you a question? Do you, um, so do the individual artists or presenters or producers have sole responsibility for all the marketing of their events, or do you have a shared calendar that people can go to to see what's going on? That's a really good question, and I think what's important about that is I think there's a, an assumption in a, particularly, I don't know how many people are here from cities, of like, we have empty space and we'll give it to artists. And it's like, oh, how will the artists pay for the production values, you know, whatever they have to create in that space, and then also why are people going to go to that space? Um, we, when we started, of course, the only people who would talk to us were um, young arts organizations that had no other place. Now, of course, museums come. But we have now built a reputation and an audience. And so people know to come to Governor's Island, and there's going to be something that surprises them. So you may be coming because there's a great graphic design show, and you may be coming to ride a bike, but you'll all do that. And then what we've done that's very important is we, we basically say to each organization, you get to produce a poster, and you produce multiple copies of it, and that's it. So Barnaby has a really you know, well-financed organization, Sherry doesn't. The audience comes and they can't tell the difference. And the interesting thing is that the organization of the two guys sitting in their apartment, they can produce better graphics often than the cultural institution. So the audience comes and they're like, cool, here's a historic costume show, here's a photography show, two guys with a pug, International Center of Photography. But they can't look at a website and yes, say and, and the, okay. yes, yes, and then we have a website, but we basically, the problem with New York is that if you try to spend money, you have to spend so much money, and if you have a little bit of money, we tell organizations all the time to zero out their marketing and their yeah, budget. Yeah, I was thinking more, if I wanted to go check out Governor's yeah. Island, I can look and see what's there that day. Yes, we have a kind of crappy website because we're the government, but but, but again, that's important because that's really changed the equation. Like Rocco came to visit once, and we had the figment guy meet him, right? So Rocco's famous as a theater producer. And I said, David, tell Rocco your marketing budget is zero. You know, and, and Rocco's like, yeah, that's not possible in New York City. But it is. A lot of word of mouth. Uh, we have permar what we call permarary work. talk about sure. what we, that evolution is and, and where you are now in it and yeah. how that curatorial discussion is now either interfering with the original intent or, or supporting it. 
So we have this sort of open call. Any of you can create an organization and fill out a permit for this summer. We, uh, and that will continue forever. We love that. Um, we call it Open House GI. Uh, but we also recognize that this site is laden with so many layers of meaning. You know, we have these weird forts, we're a boat, we're this you know, weird landscape, we have this emergent democratic culture, and we have this spectacular new park designed by a firm called West 8. And we really wanted to give artists the opportunity to kind of study and, and sort of experience all the modalities of this place that's changing. And you can really only do that with a commission. So in addition to our free to be you and me approach, we have, uh, we are working with a consulting curator, uh, Tom Eccles, uh, and we have now have two projects uh, that have been completed. One uh, an artist who works in sound, uh, Susan Phillips, who Creative Time introduced us to, because she did a temporary project on the island, and the other, uh, the sculptures you saw, the artwork of Mark Hanforth, uh, a sculpture based in Miami. And, and really, and we could see in the process that each of those artists took kind of the difference, right? Because they were able to come out in the winter when it's a scary place, and then the summer, and sort of Mark, even who lives in Miami, understand from a distance kind of the role of this place. And for Mark, what was extraordinary about his work is he was actually responding to drawings because the landscape wasn't built yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing to see them. So that we, we will continue to do that in parallel with the work we do. We think of it as um, totally complementary. And because I think the conversation in New York around site-specific work is very limited by the paucity of sites. <laughs> Um, that are available, um, and so we have this unique site, so we want to give artists that opportunity, and, and those projects we fundraise for. Other questions, or can we go back to Yep. Oh, you want to pass that? Yeah. And if people don't mind introducing themselves and saying where they're from, that'd be great. Sure. Um, Laura Lobenstein. I'm from Boston, the design studio for social intervention. Excuse my voice. <laughs> um, Jim, we, we have long believed in spectacle and tried to use that word as well, so I was excited that you used it. And part of our work has been thinking with activists about spectacle and ritual and these things that activists don't necessarily think about in their work, so I was interested. It seems like your upcoming vision is both spectacle and ritual for communities in terms of thinking about what they value and how they want to represent themselves. So I'm just wondering kind of how those conversations have gone. I think a lot of times activists feel so sort of urgent and linear in their work. So how, how have you gotten folks to think about the amount of investment that it'll take to create something that you're gonna burn and then you know, sail down a river? Right. Um, well, the, uh, the biggest thing that's happened for us is we have, we have an amazing platform, right? So the, the, this is the mayor's, uh, Mayor Emanuel's first kind of major cultural initiative. Um, and so we have literally the, you know, the main branch of the Chicago River and we have this opportunity to um, provide that platform to other um, organizations, community-based organizations and activists. So that is a, is a, um, that's, a that's a real draw for people um, and organizations and activists. So I don't think people for the most part have responded to that as, um, why would we want to do all this work for that? I think there's a sense of like, I get, I get what this could be and I want to participate in it. That said, we have long-standing relationships with many of the community-based organizations that we're working with, and we are also piloting this through three um, um, citywide organizations who have uh, real boots on the ground in these communities, in these lesser served communities like um, Ceasefire, now called Cure Violence, is a gang intervention program, and and they are really um, helping us to reach populations that we would not otherwise um, reach. Um, as an example, um, but but last summer we did some preliminary kind of um, self introductions, which is we brought this huge machine into the public spaces in those neighborhoods and sort of threw a big party with this machine that was. This machine is like a 32-foot vehicle, and then it, the front scissors toward the back, and the middle rises, and it gets to be about 16 feet in the air, and it is a platform. And so then on that platform, anybody could come up and spin, could DJ, they could um, do spoken word poetry, they could do a political diatribe. It was a, it's a huge soapbox in a sense. But its erection itself is a spectacle, and it draws people to it. So we were able to do that event and, um, and sort of introduce ourselves and introduce the concept of spectacle to people. 
And I think that that went a long way toward getting people interested. And then the final thing is, you know, who doesn't want to burn shit? Like, burn, it's not like you're throwing it out afterward. You're burning it, and that's really interesting. So we've not met a lot of resistance. How's the fire department doing? Yeah, so, you know, one of the complicated things for sure is, as Barnaby would attest to, and, and maybe even more complicated in our scenario because this is a, um, this, the, the Chicago River is a, an Army Corps of Engineers project. It, the, the Coast Guard has province over it, as well as the city, as well as um, the environmental EPA. So there's, we're dealing with lots and lots of um, bureaucracy in order to get this up. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the challenges always when we talk about per, you know, performance in the public realm is how do you do that? And so in my case, it's easy because I control the public realm that I, you know, so I can make that happen. But I'm curious if other people have experiences where if you're trying to do this, kind of what does it take to get everybody on the same page to allow something crazy to happen? People have experiences with that? Yes, sir? So the, the food truck clusterfuck to me, just permit clusterfuck uh, was the first thing that came to mind. Um, so you know, one thing that I think we've added a lot of value in is teasing out the permitting process for artists to be able to get things done um, as one of our kind of uh, main value adds to the process. It's not easy and it's uh, very kind of overwhelming and nobody wants to spend any time with that process. Um, so the extent to which um, we provide a very clear roadmap um, has allowed a lot to happen uh, legally, um, you know, which is not always uh, the case. Yeah, yeah and I think w we showed you the picture of the Carousel Festival. Little did I know that the elevator division of the Department of Buildings issues the permits for carnival rides in New York. And imagine the conversation when you have a 1910 carnival ride and they're asking for as-built drawings. That was a, getting those guys to yes, like, you know, was, you know, actually. So I'm from the city of Minneapolis and um, we have a festival in the city called Northern Spark, which is an all night festival. It, it starts at sundown and goes until sun up the following day. And it's basically participatory art. It's or anyone, you know, anything doing anything all over the city. And that was, um, it's actually administered by a nonprofit. But what, uh, we, this is our third year. And over, over time, we have actually built a relationship. So from the government side, they initially came to us asking for permits. And it took forever because often they're asking for things that, you know, really out of the box, and we have to figure out how are we going to do that, how are we going to work that within our rigid permitting system. But now we've in, we're in a situation where I and uh, Steve Dietz, who's the curator, go together, and we negotiate. Um, and we're, we're in a situation where now Steve is working very closely with us to actually develop projects, for, temporary projects for underutilized spaces. So it's moving to the next level where we're going beyond the festival and into a, you know, um, creating competitions, temporary artwork, um, interactive work. He works in media mostly. But it's, it, we've developed the relationship. And responsively, the city has, has also created a team that comes together. Because ev we all know that there's not going to be one person, but many people from the police to fire to everybody else that's got to look at the request. So I, I think that's been a sort of a, um, an organic thing, but it's actually really worked and it stayed there now. It's, that's what's happening. So one of the things that, that I talked about and, and I know you talk about is that these temporary events transform places. So how do you make, and I'm sure this is a question for everybody, how do you make that case? So um, one of the things I'm looking at NATO because I love Creative Times work, they did this amazing project actually above our ferry, uh, David Byrne playing the building and you know, for those of us who got to experience it, you were in this vast derelict hall, and there was this organ connected to the pipes. It was amazing. Now that building, that'll become a uh, catering facility. Um, so that memory of that is almost like you know, the layers buried. So I'm just sort of curious how people think about making the case that it's worth all the effort to do this temporary whatever, right, exhibition event. Um, and that it requires an enormous amount of effort, funding, et cetera, 
but then goes away. You know, it, is this on? Is this on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's just soft. Yeah. You're soft. Uh, anyways, you know what I think it's like, just to go to the spectacle thing, you know, it's almost like you think of it in urban cities, like the learning curve in different cities is different. Where the mayor's at, where the Department of Cultural Affairs is at, it's always different. And, I, you know, for me, like, spectacle is like the training wheels to get to the really good stuff in a way. It's like, it's a, it's a way to get everyone on board. So like, you know, the, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a snob, right? So like, Nui Blotch, I kind of like, uh, but I can see how it really makes a lot of headway. Mass appeal, kind of Cirque du Soleil aesthetics. Everyone's kind of, yay, family goes out. Cities get crazy about it. And then it really opens doors in terms of the imagination of cities. Like, wow, this is possible. And I, we were just talking about it, Second Saturdays in, uh, in Miami. And that's a different thing, which, which was more of this kind of catacall of come one, come all, artists from every stripe, just show your stuff. And those things are good, but also, too, sometimes you're like, there's a lot of crappy art in the city, but people seem very excited. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good, too, because I think that's also training wheels for a city. So, so, but at the same time, too, it's, for me, the arts, it's like, you want to get that stuff out there so that you can start doing the stuff that's grittier, heavier, in New York, I think we have this advantage for a long history. The arts man's always supported it. So like we have, I mean, that's why I think Chris has this in your city, why you're able to do these things, because it's like, it's part of the tradition there. So we don't have to prove the arts matter in New York as much. But in other cities, I talk to folks, and they're like, oh my god, we have so far to go. <laughs> you know, we got, our mayor doesn't get it at all. And that's when I think you got to like have this big spectacle thing, because like, you know, and they help too, because they see these newly launched things. Or like the gates, you know, they're like, I want that. I want the waterfall. But I think like in terms of just, I, I don't know, just to say, because in order for creative times to survive or even exist in any city, you need a city that's willing to talk to the fire department, that's willing to talk to codes to make it easier on you. Because it's, a, you know, you need people, you need expediters who are gonna get this stuff past permit wise. Because basically the whole city's built to not let you, most cities are built to not and we, we've, you know, we've come, we started as a, you know, $17,000 a year storefront with no permissions for anything. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was, I mean, the rule for us was you just don't ask, like, ever. And um, you can get really far that way. I mean, I, I sit here as testimony to, to, to okay. see, forgive forgiveness. Me. forgiveness. Yes, yes, right. exactly. Um, So, you know, but then at a certain point, you cross a tolerance point where you need, and I think it's good to just say, to own that, we're not, you know, um, negotiating these permits. It's true. We're doing that through, at this point, Department of Cultural Affairs, the Department of Transportation. They're going to, they have to go figure out how to pitch what we're doing to the fire department, to the coding department, so that it makes sense to them and they permit it. And that's that's an important thing to say, like, I'm not often... I have, but I'm not often sitting in the room with the people who grant the permits. I'm sitting in the room with the people who are going to go get the permits for us. And so there is a city advocacy um, part of this. I think it's true about spectacle as, um, not, for me, not so much the training wheels as like the Trojan horse. It's how do you get, you know, how do you use that big item to get in there to do one little thing that's, mm-hmm. that's interesting. And, and that's... Um, Go ahead. So uh, this issue about permanence and, and temporary, I mean, I think part of the, wow, this one's louder. Um, so I think part of the, what I think I like, I like a lot about the temporary is that it becomes a demonstration, right? And you're never going to, Governor's Island's interesting because you're trying to always be temporary, but you're limited to this place. I think in most cities, you, you would try something temporary in a place to demonstrate that it can work, to demonstrate that their people will come, that people appreciate it. And then it sort of like paves the way for something more permanent. I, in, in places that you know aren't completely built out like New York, I mean, it's like there's there's like this extra space that it's sort of you use this temporary as purely a demonstration or as a sampling or as a, a just a pilot. You're you're not necessarily, I don't know if cities can always be always temporary in any place. I think eventually you prove it out enough, and then people generally are like, damn, we could do this every week here. And then all of a sudden, that's not a temporary thing anymore. That's a real installation. That's a real business. That's a real event uh, um, or occurrence or something. So I think there's th- this idea of, of using the temporary as, as experimental, as proving things out, as but then they move. Yeah. 
And I mean, the, 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 in general, like, it seems to me there are two basic arguments that people use to justify transformation of space, where they say, you know, we've transformed that space in the hearts and minds of the people who got that experience, who were there, and they see that public space completely differently, or that space completely differently, its potential is completely transformed for those people and the people who catch the rumor of that. Um, that, that space is transformed in that way, and that's powerful for sure. And then I think the second line is, um, you know, we, we've transformed that space because we see the economic impact of these kinds of cultural events. Now, you know, that space like Logan Square was at one time completely working class, poverty class, welfare class, and now where we did those events, you know, it's the hippest area in the city. It's, it's our, uh, it's the Brooklynization of Logan Square is what we call it. Um, and, you know, it's completely transformed. But uh, there wants to be some other line between those two that, that you get at that's about somehow um, the, the creating through these temporary um, um, fixtures, through ephemera, you've created the potential for action that, um, that is different than it was before that event happened. And you know, development is one route, but there wants to be other routes. And it's a little unclear to me, and I asked this question to the group through somebody else yesterday, but you know, how, how do you really get into some of the social justice issues of what happens when you activate a public space or a space enough that now you've basically, um, well, frankly, run counter to the social agenda that, uh, began, that initiated the enterprise. And it happens to us right. time and again. I want to again. push back a little bit just on what you said, because we totally believe in improvisation. We had this great comment from someone who joined our team, and she said, I've never worked in a place where improvisation is your norm. She said, <laughs> I, th I thought of improvisation as what you did after you failed. You just do it all the time. And we can talk a lot about how, all, like the, the new park that we've just finished, you know, so much of its design and sort of is based on kind of starting things and changing them. But, you know, cities are about ephemeral experience, right? That's why we live in cities. Um, and with all credit to people who don't live in cities, right? It's like I walk on the street, it's going to be different every day. Yeah. And so, and I, and I think that notion of I miss something, right? The New York is, right, the city most obsessed with what did I miss? Oh my God, <laughs> I didn't see the rain room at MoMA, you know, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> Um, so, so I think, you know, I, I don't think it's just about laying the case for like, here we're going to have an art project and then it's, you know, we're going to have people dance and then hopefully we're going to get a public sculpture. It may just be enough that there's dance happening and, you know, we made that easy for that to happen. But I think there were a lot of hands that came up just before. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So can we just, can, can we have some people who just haven't spoken yet? Um, I, I wanted to know if you had any creative security um, have you done any incentives like that? Because a lot of times doing a big spectacle in a city where there's a lot of crime, everybody security happy at the municipal level. So the cops come and they put their bright lights on, you know, flashing to shut streets down. And it's a, a danger signal. And I think like doing things like making it the event lights, they're purple on the cop cars. Like there's just like when you're coming into an event in a city, there's the security question. So I would love to know if you've found some creative solutions to this. Um, we haven't had that issue uh, with concerts. NYPD is very good at profiling acts and their entourages, so there's different, for, but those are more for our traditional concerts. So um, in, tr in terms of, you know, kind of different levels of security, uh, quite frankly, we're an island, so that's one of the great things is that we don't really have security issues. Sports cops, which are oh, great. much more friendly. Friendly and people want to see pictures no matter what. Great, this will be the action people no matter what this. Thanks. We ran into this big, uh, uh, in a big way last summer because we were working with ceasefire and ceasefire d let me just give you a little background on ceasefire um, ceasefire is there was a documentary on ceasefire called the interrupters but their policy is within 20 minutes of a homicide they will meet with the um, grieving family and um, and interrupt the cycle of violence that that usually follows any such homicide. This is gang related. Gang related right. homicides, yeah. But any any homicide really because you can't can't always distinguish. Um, anyway, so they they work in these neighborhoods and their thing is they will not work with the police. So they, they like we so when we did events with them, we had to get permits that 
excluded the police from setting the perimeter, um, which is uh, which is complicated, right? Um, so uh, in, in every case, the only way we could do that was by finding local officials who would vouch for ceasefire and vouch. For, so it was in one place. It was the park superintendent who literally was part of a motorcycle gang. And he said, like, my motorcycle gang is going to watch the perimeter. And that's how we're going to get it done. So I mean, we've really, you know, so, so it, and it, it goes to something that was said earlier. But just, I guess, to, to Lori, that you, know, you, you have to work micro locally. And for us, at least, hyper you know, um, with the high level of city officials simultaneously bouncing back and forth. I saw a bunch of other hands. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Cindy Ordstein. I'm the Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Mesa, Arizona, and Executive Director of the Mesa Arts Center, which is the largest multidisciplinary arts center in the Southwest U.S. Um, but I used to run a, a very large uh, once-a-year festival in, in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I've done a lot of both ephemeral work and annual work of short term. And I want to speak on behalf of the importance of those activities for not only changing the way people perceive space or, and a place, but the way they perceive their own relationship to art and the way they perceive art itself. Because I think what's really important is the way it takes the experience of art outside of what they might think of as the norm or the standard experience and, and I think shakes up people's ideas about the place of art in society and the place of art in community, as well as the place of art, or the, the role of art in place. So I think those are very important for our field in terms of a lot of people coming out of curiosity or because they think it sounds fun, it sounds like a family event, they maybe don't think of themselves as um, art patrons, really, art goers, art users, art makers. And I think that the these kinds of ephemeral experiences or short-term temporary experiences really change the minds of a lot of people about their relationship of art and the place of art in their community and in their own lives. And I think that that's incredibly important for us to do as a field. One thing I want to add to that for us having people meet artists, right? Here we are, great, right? Everyone thinks that's great. Most people in New York City, most educated, sophisticated people have never met an artist. And it freaks them out. Because, the, you know, and so I will just tell one of my favorite stories. We have a s open studios. It's a requirement of our artist studio. And we have a lot of Hasidic families who come, right? So everyone talks about diversity. Nobody talks about trying to get Hasids, right? <laughs> I love. No, seriously, right, because Hasids, that's not chic. You know, that's not multicultural. And we have a lot of Hasids. We work with that community to make sure they're welcome. We have a kosher vending machine. You have no idea what it took to get that. Um, but so there's this Hasidic family talking to an artist. And she said, she's walking through the artist studio, just like NATO's walking to see his friends. She says, I'd like you to draw my children. So this is a conceptual artist. He's completely lacking a vocabulary to explain to this mother that what he does is not what she thinks art is. So on the one hand, I'm like, isn't this amazing? Because right in our city, the Hasidic community is very segregated, very distrustful of outside communities. You don't see them doing things that other people do, typically. So I'm like, wow. She, but that interchange for both sides was very profound. Because um, he, you know, he was used to explaining his art to me and to NATO and to the people in this room, but not to like, no, I don't do portraits of children. So that exchange to me, like when I walk in that studio, I think, and I wasn't there for the story, I heard it third hand, it is about that essence. And, and those, those social interactions happen from both spectacle, which is another word for scale, getting up to something that really suddenly gets the politicians and the funders willing to do it. But it's also the ephemeral nature is if we don't have these special events, you have to make this point that everyone has to come to be there and be present, that that's when those interactions happen. And the other thing I just wanted to add that came out very clear here, people are asking how do you get the trust that you've got on Governor's Island. I mean, you have to earn it, you have to build it, but it's, an, it's a larger ecosystem. And this is where I worry a little bit about this metaphor of the field, which is a monoculture and is in rows and produces a harvest with you know, industrial farmery that goes into the silo. 
because actually to do this placemaking is a much more complicated task of a whole ecosystem of participants and trust and interaction and new audiences and a multiplicity of viewpoints and a really broad definition of art. And then incredible things can happen in the social engagement, Shim, that you've been doing, and, and Leslie on Governor's Island. People are now going because they know something interesting is going to happen. Exactly. And it's that ephemeral nature, they're going to go there. And now they're suddenly open to going to something that they completely can now admit, I don't know what I'm going to go see, but I'm interested. And it's kind of the same. So I, I, I will try to put my thoughts together. I think that was an incredibly thoughtful um, comment, Brian, so thank you for that. Um, I was having a conversation in the last couple of weeks with a few people thinking about creative placemaking as a field and, and how um, much of a mis misnomer that, that idea is and thinking about even the behavior behind creative placemaking. So basically the conversation started with someone asking a question, well, what are the aesthetics of creative placemaking? And, and me being like, well, okay, well, let's, let's cycle that back a little bit. Like what's the behavior that creates the aesthetic? Oh wait, no, what's, how do we create the agency that builds the behavior that creates the aesthetic? Okay, so it goes back to people and kind of to what you're saying, Jim, about the, the special sauce, the secret sauce is really creating agency in people to take ownership of a, of a place, to be inspired, to then create something. So, so kind of circling back to the idea that I, I'm a funder, I should start right there, I'm, I'm a funder, um, and, and we do a lot of intervention, ephemeral, temporary work, um, partly because it's very interesting work in our communities, and also because the art sector as a field is in such I, disarray is the word I want to I want to use right now. Um, that that from the largest organizations to the smallest organizations, interventions we see are being as the most interesting way to get people to think differently because business as usual isn't going to work both within institutions and within communities. So, I mean, I guess my question to you all as practitioners um, is how how important is it to you that that things scale or become permanent? I mean, is that important? Can you define thing in that sentence? Things, um, happenings, organizations, um, the artists that are creating work becoming institutionalized in some way, however thing is defined with, with this group. Go for it. Uh, the, the answer to the question for many of us in Tucson, Arizona, um, uh, I'm not a, a, a member of an art place grantee, but I am a part of the arts council there that has an initiative called Place, People, Land, Art, Culture, Engagement. Well, let, let me just say that that conversation that I just referenced uh, was with Roberto. Was Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably watching this now. Hi, Roberto. Hi. Um, so the answer to your question, so you'll know what my answer is, it's, it, it, the permanence for that particular initiative is not important at all. It's those steps behind it and the sense of agency being permanent, that's important. I mean, the question that you asked to me is, is, is really core about when we engage with people in communities to co-activate um, and animate space, what responsibility do we have for what happens after that transformation and, and the folks who come in behind it? Um, in terms of ensuring that if they want to stay in the space or in the neighborhood that they can and that things change in a way that they have at least a seat at the table rather than being on the menu, so, so to speak. So uh, to me, it, the, this notion of temporary and ephemeral is um, it's a means to a, some other end. You know, it, art is a tool in the toolkit that's a means to a, another end. And so for me, I was at the table that was talking about this as a movement, not as a feel, because I think that means that we are planting seeds, and we're gonna stick with the agricultural metaphor. Grew up in Nebraska, so I can use this too. You know, <laughs> we're planting seeds that other folks may harvest. A a and that we need to be cognizant of then what are we are, are helping to cultivate and what are we helping to plant as seeds, if that made sense. So the answer in Tucson in, in terms of places, permanent is not so important in terms of the physical path. Other answers? Yeah. Well, Mark, ahead. why don't you try? Yeah, uh, uh, my name is Mark Murphy. <laughs> uh, I'm the uh, executive director of Red Cat here in Los Angeles. Uh, Center for Contemporary Performing Visual and Media Arts, and we're connected to the California Institute of the Arts. And our project, 
Art Place, one of our big initiatives recently has been the Radar LA Festival, of uh, an international festival of contemporary theater. And we thought about, not permanence, but about trying to um, uh, use strategies to maximize the way that a, a festival might resonate beyond uh, the, the you know, 10 days of the festival itself. Um, we utilized as part of the last uh, Radar LA Festival a number of the historic theaters that we toured yesterday. We had five different sites along Broadway from free events at the Grand Central Market to um, events staged in the Palace Theater and the Million Dollar Theater and the Tower Theater, all at various stages of, of uh, user-friendly uh, uh, status. Talk about the permits, but another topic. But, but um, and one of the uh, uh, editorials that was written after the festival spoke to a few uh, impacts. One was audiences who live in Los Angeles that had never been a pedestrian downtown or seen those facilities began to think about downtown differently so that can resonate amongst uh, people's own perceptions of the city where they live. But also other colleagues, cultural organizers and, and others began to uh, see our use of some of those spaces as a sort of a pilot project at a time when people are considering what form downtown development should take and how these theaters might be used or might be uh, um, an ongoing part of the cultural life of the, of the city. Um, and of course the owners too began to think about things differently and imagine the possibilities of what, um, the res what a great resource they had. The, there's a second phase to our project, which was, uh, which I'm realizing more and more was really the, the key to its uh, impact. The festival was international, but half of the projects were uh, by Los Angeles-based artists or collaborations by LA and visiting artists. But the second phase of our, of our project is um, a series of artist residencies of development opportunities for local artists, mostly, in the performing arts to develop new work. There's a real lack of infrastructure uh, uh, in most cities, but especially in, in Los Angeles, for the development of new work, especially in contemporary dance and contemporary theater. So we're trying to nurture and incubate projects, not necessarily, uh, definitely for a future edition of the <laughs> festival, but for presentation by us or some of our uh, uh, partners on the uh, um, festival or in general um, in an ongoing way. In a, in a way, rather than a bricks and mortar permanence that was seen as an investment in trying to establish, well, perhaps teach some of these artists to fish in a way that, uh, that there may be longer, uh, greater infrastructure that they can or other organizations can provide, or at least provide some temporary uh, uh, support to them as an example of how that might help to enhance the, uh, the, the quality as well as the uh, you know, in integrity of the artist's work ongoing. So Michael Forsyth with <coughs> Revolve Detroit, our program centered around activating vacant storefronts uh, through art and entrepreneurial activities. We do a lot of temporary use sort of stuff. So our end game is permanent change. So we want, um, and you know, I work for an economic development agency, um, you know, traditional old school economic development. Um, I get to do all the fun projects. So our end game is filling the space full time um, with someone paying full time rent. But you know, one challenge we've had, you know, is in Detroit things change so rapidly, and you know, it's more about an intervention to change the trajectory of, you know, these neighborhood business districts where they're going. You know, it's they're one bad lease away from getting a couple bad businesses that's going to kind of influence the mix and. You know, or it's one other storefront that goes vacant that's going to go into disrepair and, you know, the cy cycle continues. So one of our main challenges is, you know, creating some permanence in, in the process itself. And, you know, there's a, there was some conversation around um, building capacity and leadership and, you know, who, who leads. Um, is it artists? Uh, is it entrepreneurs? Is it some of your kind of untraditional um, leaders, people who aren't used to playing a leadership role? And... For us, one thing that's been very powerful is, you know, taking this, what people view as a liability, and creating a new ownership structure over it. Ownership is a big issue in Detroit, um, you know, centered around vacancy. So when you create ownership over, 
you know, what people typically view as a private space um, and make it public so that, you know, the community feels a sense of ownership. I always say, if we build it, we will come. Um, you know, that has seemed to work very well for us. The big challenge has been, you know, the, the ability to um, empower these leaders um, who have been able to do the space activation. You know, they're living there permanently now. They've kind of taken it on. Um, and that's a great thing. And you know, we've had these spectacle, these big festivals to get everybody out. And people see the value of arts programming now and they're trying to sustain it. But the real challenge now is how do we sustain it? You know, we've changed the image a little bit. That's, that's part of what we try to do. Um, but in terms of sustaining that process of you know, creating rituals, creating arts programming um, for those artists who aren't used to, to playing that role. You know, it's more, it's more than just them now. Um, and that's been, a, that's been a challenge for us, you know, in that terms of leadership capacity. How, how, how do you build that? And it sounds like, you know, you're doing some of this work in Chicago's um, kind of pagan ritual. What do you want to get rid of? What do you want to see? We've tried to do some of that, but when it comes down to actually doing it, um, you know, we've gotten you started, but we don't have the, we can't hold your hand the whole way. How do you get people to, to continue on that road and, and do it themselves? I think, <coughs> I think we're just about to wrap up. I just want to oh. close with, um, if I can, with, with a, a small warning. Because I think that, um, I'll, I'll you know. Start, I'll do something inspirational then. Okay, <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, then I'll hand it to you for the inspiration. Um, you know, I think a lot of us who get into this work are interested in social justice issues. We're interested in economic development and community development, et cetera. And, um, and yet those of us who are artists or even those of us who are um, producing artists or curating artists, I, th I think we need to be really careful of, of um, when we start talking about permanence, when we start talking about you know, the, uh, uh, determining the impact, the effect of our work. Um, we start to, um, A, uh, we start to become the, we, we're in danger of becoming the another layer of we know how to do it for everybody and we have the formula and you should follow this path too. Um, but, but most importantly, we begin to close down for ourselves the kind of truly deep idiosyncratic and particular voice that drives the project and, and that makes it valuable to begin with. If we were urban planners, we would be urban planners. If we were um, social engineers uh, of any variety, but, but, but the artist is driven by something else and being true to that and tying oneself to that as closely as possible is actually the greatest virtue that we have. Sherry is I, I just wanted to say one thing about the permanence versus temporary. I very often just think the permanent is about making a statement, the temporary is about asking questions. So are you trying to make a statement? You know, are you trying to mark a gateway? Are you trying to you know, put something there permanently because it's, it's going to say like, this is okay or this is what we're about or whatever it is. But, you know, a lot of us who work in the temporary choose it because we're interested in the variety of questions. And that means a variety of scale, that means the intensity of, of you know, the, the social fabric, et cetera. Um, so it's not, you know, it's really about what are you trying to do and then making the right choice for, for what it is. So um, I, I just wanted to, because I'm mindful of the time, uh, my husband's a theater producer, and uh, he produces cheesy entertainment as well as, and he has this phrase which is, did it transport you? You know, what is that? And so one of the things I think is amazing about the work that people are talking about is that it transports the public in a shared moment, but that shared moment you carry with you. You know, whether you walk through the gates, whether you saw David Byrne, and that space and you as a member of the public are changed forever. And how, you know, whether that needs to be institutional, you know, that's what we're talking about, and how it gets funded, those are all the practical things and permits. But to me, that's what's so exciting about what the ephemeral can do on a wacky island, in a downtown, wherever it is, because people will still be talking about your festival. You know, they, it, the Tower Theater may not open again for 20 years, but people will remember that moment, and when they drive past the downtown LA exit, they're gonna say I had a different relationship to downtown LA. 
And so that's, I, I think, sort of the virtue of that. We, I'm mindful of time, so, so the boat is leaving, as we like to say on <laughs> Governor's <laughs> Island. Um, but thank you all for participating, and we're on to our next activity.